On this episode of Travels with Bill, we're visiting a lake, but it's not like any lake we've ever shown you before because this isn't actually a lake. This is the Inland Cement Quarry just north of Mafeking, Manitoba. Before we're done, we'll tell you why it's full of water, why they don't make cement out of this anymore, and what happened to the railway track. That's all ahead, so stick around. We're flying over where they used to load the limestone onto the rail cars, and before we get too far, it's important to note this area is owned by Inland Cement, and trespassing is forbidden. Certainly people do swim here, and you'll see signs of occupation, like that well-traveled road, but it's illegal to go into the quarry, and it's dangerous too. In fact, there's been a death in the water when someone was swimming, so enjoy the video, but you really shouldn't go in to check it out yourself. It was 1912 when the potential for making cement was first realized about 16 kilometers north of Mafeking. The area contains high calcium limestone that's suitable for Portland cement. Claims were staked in 1955 and assigned to the Saskatchewan Cement Corporation. The next year, exploratory drilling found up to 60 feet of high calcium limestone in this, the original quarry. Production began there in September of 1956, with the early production rate being 181,000 tons a year. There's other less desirable limestone below the main layer, but high freight rates meant that wasn't produced after the first year. We're looking down into the water here, and that's one of the neat things about the quarry. Of course, on this old quarry, you can kind of see the slope down in, but look how you can see some structure under the water too. That's part of what makes it dangerous. People were diving into the water and they hit some of those rocks. Well, it didn't end well at all. We're flying towards the second quarry. Now, why is there two? Well, by 1957, Inland Cement had purchased the Saskatchewan Cement Corporation. By 1971, the quarry was producing 363,000 tons annually. It operated seasonally from May to November. There were two levels active, with a bench established 14 to 17 meters below the highest point. The rock was broken by filling blast holes and exploding them. By this time, the quarry was 28 meters deep, 671 meters wide, and 355 meters long. By 1974, the production was continuous throughout the year, but the original quarry was running out of material. It was abandoned in 1976. That's when this second quarry was opened, in late 1976, less than half a mile north of the entrance road. By August 1977, it was 11 meters deep. Limestone from the new quarry was trucked to the crushing plant, then loaded on rail cars. Well, this new quarry certainly gives you a lot better view of how it works. You could see how that road went right down into it before, and there's some high parts, but there's also some very deep parts. Notice the color of the water? Well, it's high calcium limestone, right? That's affecting what you see in the water and it's such a beautiful spot. Now, if it was legal to go swimming here, it would be a major attraction, but it is privately owned and you're not supposed to be in here. Well, the road tells me people are coming anyway. I can understand why they do, but really, you're not supposed to do it. Fun fact, do you know there are caves here? During excavation, crews would occasionally find caves up to six feet in diameter. They were filled with clay, but they had crystals attached to their walls from before that clay showed up there. Well, speaking of crystals, here's a look at them. We're looking at pyrite with a little bit of calcite. Then we're looking at calcite with just a little bit of pyrite. And finally, we're going to look at just calcite crystals. These are the types of things you'd be finding in the caves underground here. Now the quarry's always had a special place in my heart because when I was a kid, I actually came here on a school tour and it was so cool. And of course the trains full of the limestone would go through town and I love trains, so that was a good thing. And th then the train stopped. There was no more quarry, the jobs all ended and that was it. We're looking at the road here from the new quarry. Of course, this is where those trucks would haul the calcium back to the crushing plant. It's just down the road there. By the way, you're looking at Highway 10 going by there, and in the far distance, you're actually seeing Bipole 3. It's really close to this quarry too. One of the big reasons I wanted to explore here was to find out once and for all, why did the quarry close? And we're going to tell you before we're done. But before we get to that, I want to show you how it worked and give you some idea of what used to be here. Because if you're like me, you maybe just barely remember this place. And if you're much younger than me, you don't even know why it's here. We're going to solve that. So we're looking here at the rail loading facility. Now it's seen better days, obviously. But at one point, you would have been loading rail cars here with calcium. That's basically what you would call limestone. It would be crushed to fit in the cars easily and it would get dumped in there. It's a little bit like you'd see in an elevator, right? You elevate it up, then it just dumps into the cars from the top. 
well, maybe it's hard to understand, but we'll get to that more too. Off to the side, there's what used to be, I think, the crushing facility. I assume that's it because the three-phase hydro comes here. That's one of the neat parts about the site. The three-phase hydro is still here. You see, Inland Cement is paying to keep it here just in case they ever decide to reactivate the quarry. Of course, they'd have to build new buildings, do all of that, but they wouldn't have to pay millions of dollars to run a new hydro line. By paying a little bit a month to keep it here, Manitoba Hydro leaves it intact. It's kind of like an insurance policy in case this place ever needs to be used again. We're flying down the old railway right of way here. You can see that really straight track. Well, that's obviously how people are getting in on four wheelers and such to the quarry. They're going down the old rail bed. It curved around here and then went right to that loading facility. This was always a spur. It was never a through track. It came off of the Irwood subdivision. The trains would come up here, load, and then take the cars back down to the Irwood subdivision and carry on to their final destination. You see the fence around the quarry as well. Well, it's kind of useless because it ends and it goes in. You can see where the road just goes around the end of it. It's kind of a fence made to keep people out that didn't want to go there anyway. Because anybody that did want to get in simply goes around the end of the fence and, well, carries on along. You know, there's another place in Manitoba where they did this. Down by West Rock, they loaded limestone there too. And they haven't torn everything out. So if we jump on down to West Rock, I can actually show you kind of how this worked. Their setup's a little bit different, but it's very similar. And I think you'll figure out what used to be happening here. So by magic, we're about four hours south. This is along Highway 16. Now there's another quarry not that far from here. The rail line didn't go right to it, so they hauled the limestone to here, then loaded it on the rail cars. Well, obviously they're storing tank cars here today, but see that big conveyor belt, how it went up? What isn't here is a crushing plant, and I assume that happened over at the quarry end. The pre-crushed limestone would end up here, get dumped in, and then simply get loaded on the cars. But it does give you some idea of how this used to work. In Mafeking, like this, we had a large conveyor belt to get up there so the limestone could be dumped on in. What exactly is inside of that conveyor belt? Well, I wanted to know too. Turns out the equipment's still inside and it's a little rusty, but see the rubber belt? That would turn, haul the limestone way up the big path there, and then eventually it would get dumped down into those rail cars. You know, long after they stopped doing limestone here, they loaded grain cars for a while. They actually built some bins and set it all up and were loading grain. That's been removed now because they've moved on from the site, but there's still some of the limestone infrastructure left here. You can see how it's a big culvert. How'd they get up on that? Well, there actually used to be a big mountain of limestone here. The trucks would just drive right on over top. So where you're seeing those grates, that was actually on ground level when the limestone pile was here. Trucks would drive up, dump out the limestone, they could push it in if they needed to with a loader, and up the conveyor belt it went before it finally got onto the rail cars. Okay, that's enough for our field trip down to southern Manitoba. Let's head back to Mafeking and learn a little bit more. Now, I mentioned I was up here as a kid in school, and I did something other than like trains and, well, go places on field trips. I was big into photography. So I present, without further ado, Bill's photos of his school field trip. Well, we start inside the school bus, obviously shooting through a window with a flash on. I didn't say I was a great photographer, I just said I was one. If you recognize that flash, it's from a 110 camera. That's what this was shot on. Now our next shot is the kids out by a pile of limestone. And it looked like a big pile of white rock to us, I suppose. Getting into the better shots here, remember we talked about a conveyor belt? Well, here's proof that it was there, and we've actually got a bit of a close-up for it too, for how it worked. Now certainly there's the hydro pole, there's the conveyor belt, and it's going over that road to where they must have been loading the rail cars. This was in the early 1990s, so it must be kind of how it was when the quarry closed. Well, here's some of my friends standing by the wheels of one of those trucks where they hauled that limestone. Bet you guys never thought you'd end up in my video. And then proof of trains. This is in Swan River by the elevator. See the caboose and see the CN cars? Guess what? Those were full of limestone. Now, as it turns out, I'm not the only one that was taking photos. Marge Lillies got in touch with us when we were doing some research on the quarry. Her dad was Tom Lillies. He and their whole family lived in Mafeking. He worked at the quarry from 1956 until his retirement in 1983. Tom Lillies was a driller and a blaster. Grace Lillies, by the way, worked as a substitute teacher and then a kindergarten teacher in the Maffa King School. These photos are mostly from 1956. That would have been in the old quarry just after it opened. Because remember, it was 1956 when they started work here. Well, no wonder they were excited to be taking photos. But look at the hard work they were doing. 
Of course, as time went on, technology got better, the machines got bigger, and it was a lot easier when things turned out while wow, they were working so hard. Here's a nice color shot of them blasting rock. Look at all the dust that would make. Oh, it'd be a dirty job. Now, I mentioned the train stopped running and the quarry closed. There were some washouts on the railway track. A lot of stuff went on. Is it the train's fault that the quarry is no longer here? Well, it's a bit of a long story. You look at the quarry, I'll tell you what really happened. The Irwood subdivision once ran from Swan River to Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan. It was built by the Canadian Northern Railway starting in 1899 and was complete in 1905. It became part of CN Rail in 1919. In 1970, the line carried Her Majesty the Queen as she toured Manitoba. But during that tour, the Queen actually drove right past this quarry in a car. I'll tell you why at the end. The quarry was located on a spur of the line that came from Mafeking. The spurs started at mile point 45.3 and ran 5.9 miles. It was known officially as the Inland Cement Spur. It was June 30th, 1994, when the Canadian Transportation Agency ordered the spur, as well as the line from Birch River to Baden, be abandoned. It was a result of an application by CN Rail. In their application, CN Rail said the line was losing money. In 1990, it made just over $150,000, but then things went downhill. In 1991 and 1992, it lost nearly $400,000 a year. Revenue from the line in 1990 was $2.6 million. In 1991, it was $1.6 million, and in 1992, it was $1.1 million. That entire decline was said to represent only 1,099 carloads lost. The big decline was from inland cement choosing to source its limestone elsewhere. There were around 250 carloads a year of logs, but that just wasn't enough income. If CN had planned to keep the line going, the plan changed in July and August 1993. Heavy rains resulted in washouts on the track from Birch River to Baden. CN said it would cost half a million to fix the line, and there was no traffic for it anyway. But that isn't the entire story. When the line washed out, CN stopped operating it. Without the train, the quarry could not ship by rail. Inland Cement officially closed the quarry on October 23, 1993. The only other traffic on the line were logs from Abitibi Price. They agreed to load the logs at Birch River, and thus, CN had nothing to haul. When you talk to people, they'll be quick to remind you the limestone used to travel by rail through Hudson Bay and never really saw Swan River. That wasn't possible after 1985. That's when a section of the line running to Hudson Bay became inoperable. CN got permission to abandon the line from Baden to Hudson Bay in 1989. They said at the time it would simply cost too much to upgrade the line to carry heavier cars. It had a limit of 200,000 pounds, and CN said they needed to haul 250,000 pound loads to use the route routinely. Was the loss of that route to blame for the decrease in traffic from the quarry? In its filing, CN said it was currently carrying limestone via Swan River to Regina. You could argue that route could go either way, but something else was afoot that sealed the fate of this quarry and the rail line. In the early 1990s, demand for Portland cement had decreased a lot due to a recession. At the time, Inland Cement was operating a plant in Winnipeg and a plant in Regina. In 1993, the Winnipeg plant only operated for 82 days of the year due to low demand. Both the Winnipeg and Regina plants were closed and consolidated with a plant in Edmonton. The limestone for the Winnipeg plant came from West Rock on Highway 16. Remember, we toured that facility a few minutes ago. The Regina plant's limestone came from here at Mafeking. With no plant, there was no need for limestone. So it wasn't actually CN that was to blame, but rather a changing world. Will the Mafeking quarry ever go again? Well, the odds aren't great, but consider this. When the quarry closed in 1993, the buildings and equipment were eventually removed, but the power line remains. Inland Cement keeps it so that Manitoba Hydro doesn't remove it. Putting it back would cost a fortune. So obviously, somewhere in Inland Cement, the cost of keeping the power available, should the quarry be needed again, makes sense. And that means the quarry is still on a list of places they may go back to if the need arises. For now, though, it's a wonderful lake that's legally off-limits. And about the Queen, during that 1970 trip, Her Majesty visited both Swan River and the Paw. The tour was to officially celebrate the centennial of the Northwest Territories and Manitoba's 100th anniversary of entering Confederation. But it was a celebration of Manitoba and not Saskatchewan. That's where the story starts. 
the Queen was travelling by train, and that train ran over the Irwood subdivision to get between the Paw and Swanover, but the Irwood didn't stay in Manitoba. Shortly after Mafeking, it passed in Saskatchewan. It meets the Turnberry subdivision, and the train passed over it too. Royal protocol is that a royal should only be in the province they're officially visiting, so the Queen had a problem. If she stayed on the train, she'd break protocol. To solve that daft little problem and keep the protocol office from throwing a wobbly, the Queen got off the train. The portion of the trip between the Paw and Swanover was by motor car. Thus, the royal train did pass through Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, but the Queen did not. No breach of protocol, and the Queen went right past the quarry in her motor car. Maybe it should have been called the Royal Inland Cement Quarry. If you want to know more about the Queen's trip, we have a whole video on that Royal Train. You'll find it in the description below or by searching the channel. Well, that's our look at the quarry. As it turns out, it's not the train's fault it's not here. Certainly though, there was a lot of good jobs and of course a lot of nice trains coming out of this place. The closure of the quarry made a lot of impact on Mafeking. We'll have to talk about that someday when we tour the community. For now, at least, we keep looking at the quarry, and maybe the fact that we've all come here to look at it today means that the folks that used to work here rest a little bit easier knowing that at least it's not forgotten, even if it is, for the moment, gone. Have you subscribed to Travels with Bill yet? Hit that subscribe button and you'll know when new videos come out. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button and let everybody know this is a great video. Why not leave a comment as well? Tell us what you think of the quarry, and do you have memories of this place? We'd love to hear them. Share them below, and let everybody know what you can remember of the old inland cement quarry. For now, we bid you adieu. From just north of Mafeking along Highway 10, flying over the inland cement quarry. Until next time, on Travels with Bill.